¿sí? Bu buenas tardes eh, a todos. Good afternoon. Uh, now we are we are going to have one seminar uh, from Interasia Research Group, and uh, we have invited today to Professor Calvin Chen from uh, Mount Holyoke College mm -hmm. in the United States. Uh, he is doing research on Chinese in Italy and in Spain, and I, I think this. This kind of research has a lot of relationship with uh, some kind of research that we are also doing in, in our research group. Mm -hmm. For us, it's, really, uh, it's a, a pleasure to come with him mm -hmm. to give us uh, this seminar. Uh, because, you know, th there are a strong relationship between Chinese here in Spain and Chinese in Italy. Mm -hmm. I'm sure uh, he, he, he knows very well. Mm -hmm. He's doing fair work of the, of this, in this topic. Mm -hmm. Well, just uh, I give the word. And okay. you, you can begin when you like. Okay. Thank you very much for Gracias. coming and to give us this seminar. Okay. okay. Gracias. Okay. Uh, well, you, want you can use this. I use both. <laughs> In case I get up to this one is yes working okay okay well buenas tardes uh, I want to again thank Professor Beltran for inviting me uh, and giving me this opportunity to share some of my work with you and I want to also say muchas gracias to all of you for coming I know it's a beautiful day it's not usually easy to come and be away be inside rather than outside uh, on a day like this. So I'm very grateful uh, that you're here and I have a chance to share some of my ideas uh, with you. I will try to, uh, again, try to keep my comments. Uh, I could go on and on <laughs> about this, but I will try to, uh, I will try to uh, be brief, try to keep it maybe around 40 minutes, I hope, and uh, so that we can also uh, engage in some uh, really good uh, conversation and discussion afterwards. Uh, I'm very curious about uh, to, to learn more about what uh, what you're thinking about this topic uh, as well. And uh, this uh, talk is about uh, the Chinese in Italy. It's called uh, "Made in Italy by the Chinese," uh, and I have a very specific uh, sort of reason for calling it that, and I'll get into that in just a moment. But um, I do want to start off, I think, because uh, by, by mentioning that when we think about Italy, right, when we think about, uh, when, when we think about Italia, at least for Americans, there's a very kind of romantic uh, kind of view. And where I've done my research is in, in Prato. And Prato is uh, not that far from Firenze, from Florence. Uh, it's the, Florence is the, is the more famous neighbor, but it's only, a, by bus, it's only about 20, 20 some odd minutes away, okay? And uh, when you look at the Duomo, right, in the center of the, uh, of the, of the city, this is kind of timeless, kind of classic view. This is a picture that I took, I think it was maybe about three, uh, maybe about four o'clock in the afternoon. And this is the kind of impression, at least for Americans. This is the first thing that they think of. It's like, wow, ah, Italia, if I could be out there, having a cappuccino, it'd be nice. This is really wonderful, right? And, and this is the kind of thing that the guidebooks especially kind of uh, encourage. Um, but there's also, when you walk down to the west side <laughs> of the town, away from the center, you have a, a place called Via Pistoiesi. Uh, and this is the main section, this is the main area where the Chinese are in Prato, okay? There are a lot of businesses, right? Is it time again? Do we have do we have students who are also uh, in, in the who have, have Chinese as a major? I, is it another time for a quiz? <laughs> but anyway, you can see here. This is actually a jewelry store, it's kind of a small jewelry store, right? Uh, and there are many kinds of businesses like this, right? And it's a it's a pretty dramatic transformation. It's a pretty dramatic transformation of neighborhoods, and especially this particular neighborhood. Uh, in, uh, in Prato. And um, when native Italians especially see these kind of developments, uh, 
there is a sense of concern, there's a sense of wonder as to what is happening to Italy and what does it now mean to be Italian if in fact we have businesses like this and others, right, of, uh, and other immigrant businesses uh, where you know, often the signs are not even in Italian, okay? So, and some of this has been fueled by um, not only media reports, but also by uh, popular uh, fiction. Some of you may even uh, know the, uh, the novel uh, that was then made into a movie by Roberto Saviano, Gomorra. Gomorra. And in one section of that book at the beginning, he writes in fairly, uh, in, in, in quite a bit of detail, really, about how the Chinese seem to be involved in all sorts of mafia activity, somehow cooperating or, or, or helping with mafia activity. So there's this sense that, oh, all the Chinese here, that's how they got rich. They're doing illegal things. So the perception has been, this is only, all of these kinds of ideas and uh, uh, portraits that have been painted are ones that have actually uh, increased alarm and increased fear among, uh, among Italians. And it's also been made worse, right, by, uh, by some of the political figures uh, in Italy. Uh, the current prime minister, uh, Silvio Berlusconi, has capitalized on this, and his partners, uh, the Liga Nord, the Northern League, have capitalized on this kind of anti-immigrant uh, sentiment. And it's not a surprise then when you see pictures like this, you see Via Pistoiesi, uh, that uh, in 2008, you actually had the beginning of sustained inspections that were very much uh, like military-style raids in this area, in Via Pistoiesi. Well, inspectors who would go in and seal off uh, intersections and streets and go in and look, uh, and, and go into specific businesses uh, looking for people uh, who didn't have the proper documents, uh, looking for reasons to uh, basically shut down uh, these businesses. But if you look closely, when we take a picture like this, your, your impression is, wow, the whole street is just filled with Chinese businesses. Here's another one. This is a, a cell phone, uh, a cell phone uh, communications uh, shop. But if you step back a, a little bit, the perspective shifts a little, just a little bit more. The street is actually much more mixed than most media representations and many other kind of portraits are. It's a, there's a lot of diversification. It's not as if they went in and said, okay, we decided Via Pistoiesi is the place we want to really take over and we're going to just do that. Some stores were, were for sale, they bought them. Others then were for sale and more Chinese bought them. But uh, that whole area uh, even if Chinese shops, uh, there, that even though there are many Chinese shops, it's not entirely dominated. It's much more mixed uh, than most people think. Okay, it's much more mixed than than uh, people think. And uh, uh, the other thing I think to remember about all of this is that, contrary to popular perceptions, uh, the Chinese immigration Chinese immigration to Italy is actually quite recent. I mean, the large numbers of Chinese really started to flow into Italy uh, really in the 1980s and reached its kind of high point, excuse me, uh, in the mid-1990s. Okay, so we're having, it's a fairly short amount of time, uh, really about a generation's time, okay? About a generation's time if we take, uh, if, if we take the kind of demographic uh, kind of definition of 25 years, approximately 25 years to be a, a generation. That's how long, uh, really the, the Chinese um, have been there, okay? Now, how did they, how and why are they there? People are wondering, it's like, well, why aren't there, why, aren't, why don't they try to go to the United States, or why don't they go to Germany, or why aren't they in France? Well, they are, and they've tried, uh, but somehow a lot of them ended up in Italy, right? And uh, I asked actually a lot of people about why it is that they ended up in Italy, and some of it was by accident. They actually wanted to go elsewhere, but uh, they said, well, we had some problems, and so we ended up in Italy, a purely a place that they didn't think about. But others actually saw a lot of opportunity, a lot of opportunity. And one of the arguments that 
um, that I'm going to make is that really uh, the emergence of a Chinese community in Italy was kind of the result of uh, what we would call a, a kind of accidental storm. A lot of factors coming together that no one, that very few people anticipated, but provided the perfect opportunity for Chinese to actually uh, establish themselves uh, in Italy. And uh, it has to do with, with a few things. First uh, is the restructuring, especially in Prato. Prato is the, the kind of the hub of, uh, of um, textile and apparel production, clothing, uh, in Italy. Very, very famous, um, very uh, kind of family-run businesses, but a lot of, lot of factories that, that do everything having to do with fabrics, right? They actually uh, make the fabric, they, they dye the fabric, they, they actually put patterns on it, they design the clothes, they do everything there. It's, it's one of the big hubs. And uh, there was a long-standing process of restructuring in this industry that, uh, unknown to Italians or to Chinese, created a great opportunity for them to eventually uh, settle there. And I think the other thing that maybe uh, has received a little attention, but I think in some ways not enough attention, uh, is demographic changes, demogra demographic shift in Italy's population. Towards the, towards the end of the 1970s, you have a large number of Italians, especially in the textile industry, who started to retire. They were getting older, and their children uh, were actually in other occupations. They actually had started to become lawyers, or they, run, they ran different kinds of businesses. They became doctors. They weren't interested in taking over the family business. Okay? So there were a lot of these shops uh, that were around, but with, with, with not enough labor, not enough people to actually run them. Okay? And of course, very few people uh, thought that China would also begin its reforms roughly at the same time, its economic reforms. Right? We're talking about the, uh, the, the post-Mao economic reforms, right? post-1978. All of these things, and, and, and of course, China's reintegration into the global economy. All of these things coming together, these macro level, these very large forces that uh, are very hard sometimes for us to, uh, to anticipate are all coming together at an unusual time, right? Really in the late 70s, early 80s. And this really provided the kind of foundation for the Chinese eventually to start owning these kinds of shops. Um, not just textile uh, companies and factories, but also cell phone companies uh, and stores and a whole host of other kinds of um, shops that are really, uh, that really have um, really provided you know, very important services for, uh, for the Chinese. And uh, as some of you know, as we were talking about earlier today, uh, a, lot of the, a, a lot of the Chinese in Italy, as well as here in Spain, are from Zhejiang province, right? And in Italy, there's a very high percentage of them who are from uh, Wenzhou, who, uh, a place that we had mentioned before. And uh, one of the things that, again, uh, that people have not anticipated was how well uh, the, the kind of business practices of people from Wenzhou, how well those fit in with Italy's kind of economic structure. Okay? Uh, there, the, you, you, as you know, there are Wenzhou natives everywhere, really, all around the world. But in this particular uh, situation, there's their uh, their uh, very tight-knit family networks, which we had talked about, as well as uh, their uh, management practices and the fact that they, their businesses, t uh, the, the businesses in Italy tend to be uh, smaller family-based companies, all of this worked to their advantage. People have always been surprised. They said, well, how, how, come, how come we don't have uh, immigrants from other parts of the world who, uh, who are in the textile business in Italy, and, and, and why aren't they doing as well? Is it because there's so many Chinese? Like, it's not, it's not just numbers, right? It's a particular style of management. It's a particular kind of 
way of approaching uh, economic, um, economic opportunity. Okay? That's really where I think uh, some, of the story, uh, some of the story really needs to be fleshed out. I think uh, there are times where uh, we, can, we, we end up um, neglecting this side of, uh, of the story. It's really quite, a, quite an, uh, an impressive uh, kind of uh, thing. So let me give you that. So that was just sort of a little bit of the backdrop, and that's just sort of the, and so these are sort of the, the causes I just uh, I highlighted. And I think in term, when you think of, in terms of industrial restructuring, the one thing that um, even to many of my friends who are Pratezi, who are, who are natives of the area, I asked them, I said, well, why do you think Chinese are doing so well? Because Italy was, was the leader in the post-war period uh, in these kind of textiles. And the, the one thing that they, they, they seem to forget, I'm going to just stand up for a second. The one thing, the one thing that they seem to uh, uh, forget is that uh, a lot of the firms, the, this kind of restructuring took place over several decades. Uh, and what happened was that uh, surprisingly, or maybe not so surprisingly, uh, not so surprisingly to us now, is that a lot of the Italian textile firms were actually quite large, and the problem was that in the post-world post-war period, they had a, a lot of competition from not only Eastern European but Japanese and Korean textile manufacturers. And because of the increased competition, they, a lot of these large companies were forced to sell off a lot of their factories and actually downsize. They started getting smaller in an effort to cut costs. They said, we have, if we have two, 3,000 workers, that's just too many people to support. And so what they did was they sold off a lot of their uh, factories and the machinery that went along with it and said, look, you guys are family right here. Why don't you guys take over and maybe make, you know, make the pants for us? We'll contract you. You just work for us but we're not gonna be responsible for benefits. We don't wanna be responsible for other things, but you guys can run it, okay? And we'll just buy everything that you make, but you guys be in charge, okay? And then they said, well, we got pants taken care of. Let's do, the, let's do the jackets on this side. Why don't you guys take over? I'll give you the machines at a low price. Why don't you take over on this side? And they started over several decades to actually downsize and really reduce the size of these companies to the point where uh, almost all of the air, uh, where, where at the, uh, at the um, beginning of the post-war period in the 50s, 80% of the, of the workers were actually employed in these large, uh, large uh, enterprises. It had reversed in several decades. It, it actually, almost over 80% of the employees were actually in small family-run uh, enterprises. And that became the sort of the, the, the profile of businesses, uh, of businesses in this um, area. So there was a, a radical reconfiguration, right? a radical reconfiguration of how work was being uh, done. And uh, by the close of the 1970s, Italy's own kind of internal migration uh, not only had basically ended, but many of the people who had been working in these factories, they actually started to retire. <laughs> they were getting close and said, hey, I've done really well. I've supported my children. Uh, and they've now decided to do something else. They're much more interested in doing other things. And they don't want to run the family business. And this is the, particu this is the particular time when the Chinese are starting to get, uh, starting to uh, rebuild many of the connections, right? And there, w there had been actually Chinese, not many, but there, were, there had been some Chinese in Italy, as there were in Spain. And you have this kind of reaching out, almost. You have this kind of reaching out right at a time when, uh, when Italy has this uh, uh, labor shortage. And initially, it wasn't such a big issue. It, initially, it wasn't such a big issue for the Italian government, um, primarily because, primarily because uh, the the first few waves of immigrants going into Italy during the uh, early 80s were primarily European. They were coming from other parts of Europe to take jobs, not necessarily in textiles, but there were some. And, uh, and so Italy thought of this as very much as the American government did when, it, when, 
when anytime the economy was doing well, they saw this as, well, we're bringing in temporary workers. They're not going, they might be here for a few years, but then they'll be gone. It's not a big deal. We don't have to think, of, we'll just let them come in, issue some documentation. And it was very, um, it wasn't a very well thought out process. They tried to address problems later on and the, the, every, roughly every five to six years they would pass a new law that would try to address some of these issues. But for the most part, there wasn't a kind of comprehensive strategy um, to deal with many of these immigrants. And as many of the immigrants started coming from other places outside of Europe, that's when, uh, that's when you started to see um, really some real concern, some real concern and some real um, debate as t about the, um, the future of Italy and, uh, and about the, the nature of, of the policies themselves. Okay? But for the most part, the policies were not terribly comprehensive and uh, they weren't consistent. On one hand, they would say, well, we need the labor. We want them to come work here but we're not so sure if we want them to stay for a long time or even become citizens, right? We're not sure what, what we want to uh, do, okay? And on the other side, when you think about China's post-Mao economic reforms, which are still really going on uh, in many ways, you have a kind of, um, uh, you have a, a kind of a two-stage movement. You have a lot of Chinese, as we were talking about in, the, in our um, earlier discussion, a lot of Chinese moving from the interior regions of China to the coast. And then you have those who have some additional connections, like the natives uh, of Wenzhou, reconnecting with family and other friends um, abroad. Okay, so you have movement within the country, and then you have movement from, you have a movement of Chinese um, abroad. So all of this is uh, going on. Villagers going to towns, and then others going overseas. Okay, all of this incredible, uh, incredible movement. Now, what, what is it about Winzo people, though? They're, I mean, they're here and they're in high concentrations. Why don't we get more from Shandong or why don't we get more from another region or Sichuan or, or elsewhere? Why is it that they and maybe some uh, and others from Fujian, for example, why do they seem to be always at the top, the number one and number two groups in terms of um, of immigrants. Well, I think one part has to do with uh, certainly the desperate circumstances. There's there are not a whole lot of resources, although Winzo has now changed quite a lot. But you know, historically, it's not. Uh, it hasn't been. It's a uh, it's a port city, but it's not. It, it doesn't compare in terms of its prosperity with some of its more famous uh, counterparts. Um, and it's also a place where there's. There's just a lot of people. There's very high population density and very limited economic um, opportunity. And because of this, there's a history of out-migration. People from Windsor have been going to all, all sorts of places for quite a long time. So they have a kind of a deep experience uh, and history with this. Okay? And because of that, they also have pretty big networks. They know somebody, uh, if not in their immediate family, they know somebody uh, maybe a distant relative or even a friend who has been somewhere and they say, hey, come to Italy, come to Italia, it's great here, right? And uh, you're gonna do, do well, look at me. I've sent all this money back, I wear, you know, I, I now wear Ferragamo, I have Armani on, hey, it's, it's fantastic, it's really fantastic. And by the way, you can actually, um, if, you, if, you, if you're willing to sort of be patient and, be, and, and become friends with them. You can get a really good uh, Armani suit without the label, because they'll, they'll get in trouble if they give you the label, but you can get a really nice one for a lot less than in the store. Because in the stores, it's, I think in the United States, it's something like 3,000 US dollars, uh, which is a lot. It's, it's over 2,000 euros, I think, at the, at the current exchange rate, about 2,000 euros for, for a full suit. I said, oh, that's too much. We can get it for you for about um, 300 euros, but we just can't give you the label. And I said, that's okay, I will make my own label and I'll put it on there and I'll pretend that, I, you know, because I, I know it's the same thing just without the label. But they are now subcontracting for these companies. That's how good their work has become. They do other things too, but they are working for Giorgio Armani, they're wor working for Ferragamo, they're working for Dolce and Gabbana. Okay, they're working for all of the big uh, companies, so they've really, um, done very well, but because of that, 
because of those kinds of uh, stories. Uh, sometimes, of course, they're exaggerated, but a lot of these stories have really uh, made people think, well, maybe I should try. Maybe even if I go for two years or maybe three years, I might have a chance to do something. I'll have to work hard. I'll have to do something. But the problem is leaving China and going to Italy is not that easy, right? Not that easy. Uh, initially, a lot of people took advantage to come to Europe, I mean, not, not necessarily just to Italy, but to come to Europe. Initially, in the early 90s, uh, they took advantage of uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union, right? They took the Trans-Siberian Railroad, or some just flew. Uh, because many of the border controls tended to be a little bit loose, but they were ma they were able to make their way uh, across from Eastern Europe and then eventually into into Southern Europe. Um, but some of them paid a fairly high price. Okay, some of them paid anywhere between twenty, sometimes twenty five or even thirty thousand euros to leave. And this is again uh, with the help of these. Um, these traffickers, these people who help them get out, right? This is to kind of this kind of movement, these snakeheads, right? The, the snakeheads who, who help them find ways around. Uh, and, uh, you know, when they get here, they, don't, they often don't know people, or they, in order to pay off this money, this huge sum that they, they have to pay uh, to, to get out, they have to really work very hard, right, for very little, if any, pay. Right, so that aspect is true. There's no doubt about that. Every single person I've talked to, every single person I've talked to has said that, yeah, we, either we've experienced it ourselves or we know somebody who has. Or we know somebody who has had that kind of experience of, of uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, going across borders, paying this kind of money, right, because they want one chance uh, at making a better life uh, not only for themselves, um, but for their families. Now, these kinds of situations have actually declined quite dramatically. One, because many people have decided, I don't know if I want to make that trip anymore. It's, I'm doing well in, in, in China because my relatives are sending the money back to me, and I'm enjoying it here. I like it. This is, this is great. So a lot of people have decided not to come. And those who are coming are coming, um, again, through... Uh, much more formal processes. There are procedures now for family reunions. So it's more, you know, maybe the father came initially or the mother came, and now uh, people who are coming are all coming through official channels. They put in an application trying to reunite my family. Uh, my spouse is coming. Maybe a child will come as well. Okay, but um, this kind of undocumented kind of movement, and this kind of illegal immigration, if you will, as uh, many in the United States uh, like to refer to it, uh, this is this is dropped. There's still some, but it's not nearly at the uh, at the uh, at the level that it once was. Even just maybe I, I would say maybe five years ago, it's 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 changed quite uh, dramatically. But um, it is really quite astounding that you know they they did end up in Italy. Uh, they they tried to t they certainly took advantage of periodic amnesties, which also have taken place here in Spain, where they try to regularize or legalize right, many of these undocumented uh, workers. And, uh, but the, the one thing, as we also uh, mentioned earlier, is that Winslow people have a, also a, a fairly long kind of uh, history and reputation for uh, entrepreneurial energy and for risk-taking. They're very bold uh, in terms of starting their businesses. And, um, it doesn't mean it doesn't mean just because that they that they like to take chances like th that they like to invest it doesn't mean that they always succeed it just means that they like to they like to you know really uh, put in investment if they see something that they think they can that that they can succeed at they will try and there's no shame in that and I think that's one of the key things uh, uh, in terms of their kind of social expectations of one another is that it's not so bad to try uh, if you fail you fail you try again um, and this is this is one of the things that you actually when you when when I've spoken to many of the uh, Chinese immigrants um, who are not from Winzo, they said that's the one thing that we that that scares us about Winzo people. They are not afraid to keep trying. We're you know we lost money. We're like oh I lost all my money. I lost my investment. They find some way to get more, uh, either through relatives or friends, 
and they keep investing. And in some ways, that kind of spirit is quite reminiscent of um, some of the boldest entrepreneurs in, the, in Silicon Valley in the United States. It's also an area where they're noted for, uh, for, for risk taking and for uh, kind of a certain kind of boldness in terms of their, of their business ventures. Okay? So these are kind of the, the macro level uh, um, variables. And it, it, the, the additional advantage, of course, is that they also had um, some ties in Italy. Um, so they had some uh, connection. So they knew the situation. They had a little bit of help. Um, and that, together with all of the other things I just mentioned, turned out to be a, a very powerful package, a really powerful package that allowed them to really overcome many of the kind of obstacles that plague other immigrants, whether it's language or um, you know, other kinds of uh, social barriers or just not being used to a new environment. Um, I was so surprised, for example, and, and they kept, uh, they said, well, we know that you drink coffee because you're from the United States, but I bet you didn't know that we like coffee too. We, let's go, let's, let's go have an espresso. And I'm like, you too? I thought you like, you, you're supposed to, don't you like tea? Yeah, that's fine, we drink that at home. Let's go for a little espresso. And so it's, the, 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 you know, it, it sounds kind of funny, but I think it's a, it's a, it's a kind of uh, an example, a humorous one, of their ability to kind of shift very quickly to a new uh, environment, even though um, you know, language acquisition, learning Italian, right, uh, takes a little bit longer. Other things um, actually uh, came together very, uh, very quickly, okay? Now, one of the things when we think about Chinese success, and we also want to think a little bit about Prato, as what I had mentioned before, is that there's a kind of sense of, you know, there's, there are family-based, small batch production, right? And, and Winzo, uh, for a lot of Winzo natives, uh, the one thing that I would say is, this, is this, this was not, this did not seem foreign to them at all. Uh, there, there are a couple of structural issues. So when you think, if I'm going to start a business, they're new immigrants. They're not, they don't have enough money to actually start anything big. So they said, oh, we'll take over a small shop. Well, all the, all the fact, almost all the factories were small. <laughs> so it was perfect for them. They said, oh, how much money do you need? It's like, well, and you know, initially they would work. They actually, when they were in Italy, they actually apprenticed. They would work for two, sometimes up to five years, learning the business, right? A lot of them had some... Uh, experience working in, t in textiles in China, but a lot of them were very new to it as well, but they would actually work there, partly because initially they didn't have enough money, but as they learned the process and saved the money, that, and, and the owner then said, well, you know, I don't have anybody to take over. My son doesn't want to do this. I'll buy the, I will buy it. How much do you want? How many euros? <laughs> I will buy the, I will take over the business, right? And it was in good hands. They all knew how to do the work really well, just as well as the owners from, from whom they learned, okay? And again, this idea of social capital, right? They have the, uh, the connections with their own family, but they would also have relatives and friends once they took over. Like, okay, I need some help. Uh, and the whole area is really about textiles. Well, I'm not really good at making pants, but I, I need somebody who, who can help me make shirts. Can you come and, and, and show us how to do that? There's a lot of exchange uh, through these, uh, through these networks, and of course the risk, risk taking, and pure luck, the timing, right? When you think about the timing, all of this happened. You know, it, it's hard to imagine. It's hard to imagine the Chinese say starting now and going into a business and saying, "All right, we're going to have an opportunity to to really develop a very strong presence in." Uh, I don't know, cell phone manufacturing or something else, right? It's, it's a very different structure, a different time. And the companies are much stronger now, right? This was, a, this was just in a, in a period where the textile industry was kind of going into decline, at least in Italy. And now it's been revived, except when you look at some of the garments and you, and you say, ah, made in Italy, sometimes you just, you just, you don't realize, yes, it's made in Italy, but it was probably made by a Chinese person, okay? Very likely made by a Chinese person, more and more so, uh, whether it's apparel, 
uh, and another industry that's connected to it, uh, the leather goods industry. So purses, wallets, a lot of them are made. This whole area, uh, this whole area is dominated by these smaller scale uh, kinds of shops. And um, Prato is, you know, very um, distinctive in this regard. Uh, and just to give you, uh, just to give you an idea, um, uh, the Comune, the, 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 the kind of local government, is very funny. They, for a time, when there was a, uh, a lot of concern about uh, the Chinese in Prato, they actually had statistics posted on their website every day. How many official, you know, officially registered Chinese are there? And it was always, it was surprising, it was always between 10,000 and 11,000. And it would go up a little bit, and they would show, okay, today, 30 Chinese left. I don't know how they know this, but they would show how many left and how many new ones would come in. And, uh, uh, but when you ask other people, they said, well, I don't know if that's the case. Is it only just 10,000? I think maybe it's 20 or 30,000. No one knows for sure, right? One, because uh, many of the industries are spread out in, in all different areas. And also because there are actually many who are undocumented, right? People who haven't actually secured their, their residence uh, just yet. So, you know, if you take that estimate of 20 to 30,000 Chinese, um, the total population of Prato is about 180,000. Okay, so it's it's about a, it can be anywhere between 11 and 16 percent, and some people say it's even higher than that, but we we just don't know for sure. But that gives you an idea, right? 11 to 16 percent Chinese in a, in a in a town that did not have that many Chinese, uh, if any about 25, 30 years ago, okay? So a pretty dramatic, pretty dramatic transformation, okay? <laughs> Money, that's a big one. And this, is, this, is, this was actually not in Prato, this was just uh, in a, uh, at, at a market actually in Bologna, but this friend who I met, uh, he actually, all of, the, all of the clothing that you see here is made in Prato. He goes there and he goes around to different markets throughout Italy and, and sells them, right, at flea markets. And he has a kind of, he has this van, this very elaborate van um, where it pops open and all the stuff comes out. It's really amazing, really amazing kind of uh, thing. But the one thing I wanted to show you uh, is that uh, if you take a look at all of the different clothing, right here, sorry, I can't draw with the mouse very well, but... <laughs> You can see this. You'll notice, and this one especially, right, with the different colors, similar style but different colors. You'll notice that he sells a very wide variety of goods. And this is sort of the expectation with what is known as pronto moda, pronto moda, right? Fast turnaround but the latest style. And, they, and it's almost like this kind of custom style, customized style of production. I want five of those. Can you give me five of those in red, six in blue, right? Very small quantities. Again, typical of this kind of family style, batch oriented kind of style of production that Italy is very famous for. But the Chinese then get involved in, right? And, uh, and then start selling everywhere. You'll see a lot of these, not just in Prato, but really all over, right? And actually, if you go um, to um, the, uh, uh, the wholesale area, um, it's a little bit larger here in Barcelona on uh, Trafalgar. You'll see a lot of these kinds of, uh, of clothes as well. And they order them in Prato and in Rome. They go there once every week to two weeks to order these kinds of things. But you'll notice again, very small numbers. It's not H&M, it's not Zara, it's not thousands and thousands, right? These are very special kinds of designs. Whatever they think is fashionable and really cool, a lot of, and, and it's cheaper, but um, again, it's actually, uh, in some ways, they're faster. They're much faster than some of these big chain stores, and that's where they think they have the advantage. We can produce stuff that those companies cannot, right? They have to order well ahead of time. They have to, they have to anticipate. They have to try to think about what's going to be really um, popular. We don't. We'll know. We see something, we're going to make it, and we're going to make it you know, the, the way you want it. So you can see it's very, uh, uh, you know, he has this van and it's just got more and more. He has jeans, he has, you know, uh, long pants, short pants, every single, every single kind of design that you can uh, think of. 
But the real, the real problem, excuse me, the real problem with this kind of production, though, is that it's terrible for the factory, right? It's great for, for us as we, as we buy things, like, I want one of those and I want one of those. But the problem is that uh, the business itself is really grueling. Their work schedule is completely the opposite of any normal business schedule, right? They work at night. They don't work during the day. Uh, so to, just to give you an example, most of the time, we feel very lucky if we, well, we should feel lucky to work from 9 to 5. They typically start work, and this is a quote, they start work in the afternoon and continue through the night, finishing at around 3 to 4 o'clock in the morning, okay? Workers sleep from about 7 a.m. to 3 p.m., and they might take a break at 5, 7, 10, and maybe 2 o'clock in the morning. But they work in the late afternoon all the way through the night, mostly because gentlemen like this person here, right, he'll come in and say, I have a design. He'll come in at 4 o'clock. I have a design. I want you to make this, and I'm going to pick it up tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. So they, they draw the design, and then they start sewing, and they'll have it done. But, and he'll say, I want 25 of them. Not, I don't need 100, just give me 25. But they work through the night putting all of this uh, together because the, the, he'll come back and pick it up, and then his market is, uh, starts at 10 o'clock in the morning. So he picks it up at 8, and then he'll go and start selling at 10 o'clock. And, and he's not the only one. There are lots and lots of, uh, lots and lots of other uh, traders. Right, business people like him, who come in and ask for these kinds of um, for these kinds of items, and it led actually you know to uh, one Chinese worker who I spoke to at one of these companies to you know, to make this observation, um, which he said matter of factly, but I thought it was uh, it was in some ways very funny and yet uh, in in some ways very telling about how they they kind of um, understood this process. They said, you know. It's, it's tough, but um, you know, this, is, this is really what distinguishes us from Italians, right? Italians work eight hours per day, and Chinese only rest eight hours per day. So that's the way they thought about it. They said, you know, we, we have to. We have no choice because we actually have, we, we have a huge financial burden. We have to pay a lot of this money back to our relatives and to others. And we also have to just, we have employees who we have to, whose wages we have to uh, you know, be sure to cover uh, when it comes time to, to pay them. Okay? So um, uh, it's incredibly, uh, incredibly difficult. And the market changes very quickly. So they might have made you know, lots and lots. Uh, they might have made 25, and then he might come back the next week or in a few days and say, I want 50 more. But the next week, you know, this particular design, this one here, might be no good. <laughs> it might be terrible. It might people are like, I don't want that one. I, I want it in black, or I want I want the sleeves to be different, right? They're they're all taking chances. They're all trying to anticipate the market. But this particular market, this prone to moda market, changes much faster than um, uh, than anything that you see at Zara. At least Zara will last at least a couple months. This does may not last a week. Okay, it may not last a week because people are like ah. I don't want that. And because the price is relatively low, um, people will just say, well, I want something else. I'm going to toss this, or I don't want to wear this anymore. I'm going to buy something new. And get me a black one. And I want it to have these kinds of designs on it. Okay? And things will change so quickly. And the, the profit margins are so uh, slim. They don't make that much money off them. Okay? Uh, for the most part, they would be lucky to make, say, 10% to 15% off these uh, garments. So say, um, you know, if they, on, uh, on, a, on a piece like this, if it were, for example, say, um, say five euros, they would be lucky to make 50 cents off that. Okay, that's how, and the competition is very fierce. So sometimes it gets down to you know, 20 cents per piece or maybe 10 cents even. It just keeps, there's so many competitors out there, it, it makes it very hard for them uh, um, to feel secure about their own uh, future. Okay? Still, uh, Chinese entrepreneurs are still doing, are, are nonetheless doing very well. Okay? Their, their margins 
are, are, are kind of slim, and they often don't feel secure. But this will give you some idea. Uh, there are reports that uh, now over the last uh, 10 years or so, the number of uh, Chinese-owned businesses in, in the Prato area, okay, and, and it wasn't clear whether it was only textiles or it included others, but um, some people said it was mostly about the textiles uh, uh, companies. Um, the reports were that there were over 3,000 Chinese-owned uh, businesses, and that actually equals about 85% of the total number of companies <laughs> in um, in Prato. 85% of the textile companies are owned by Chinese people. Right? Big reversal. Uh, big reversal again. And I wanted also to show you, this is an example. This is the daughter. This is the youngest daughter who is actually also helping. She's actually a very tough negotiator. Somebody said, no, I want that for, uh, they, they said, um, you know, Cinco, cinque, cinco euros. No, 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 the equivalent, right? She's like, no, I am not, this It's already very cheap. I'm not going to, and she's, in this picture, this was taken a few years ago, she's about nine. She's the tougher, they said, well, your father said, no, no, I am not going to, your, your father always sells for lower. No, I, I'm not. You either give me the money or, or, she's like, wow, this kid's tough. She won't, she won't drop the price. He's like, it's the lowest, right? She's tougher than the dad. She's tougher than the dad. So, but you, you can again see, right? Again, this is another, it's another example. Different styles. So here's one, right? These are all, well, the ones in the back here are pretty much the same, but they're all different colors. And sometimes the sleeve design, you know, there's one with sleeves, one without sleeves. But you can see the variations. Sometimes they're very small variations like that, but sometimes they're major ones as well. But again, you can see they have at most, you know, 10 of each set or each design. And they just have, they have so much variety, but they, they can't achieve a kind of economy of scale like a larger company can, uh, like the ones that we had, uh, that we had mentioned. Okay? So this has led to, of course, all of this has led to, not surprisingly, a great deal of social friction. Okay? A great deal of, of social friction. And this is uh, uh, the Liga Nord office. It should be an I there. But you can see, stop you know, uh, illegal immigration or clandestine. See, uh, so, and this is, here's, here's another. This is the headquarters. This is the first time in Prato that they've actually had um, a, uh, a party uh, from the right open an office and had an actual uh, significant presence. Prato uh, in, uh, it was uh, three, year, two, uh, three years ago, uh, for the first time in the post-war period, uh, ha has now a government that is center-right. It's always been socialist since the end of World War II until three years ago. And in, in, uh, in, in no small part to uh, this party and also to the help that uh, Berlusconi uh, also provided. Okay. Now, the thing that I found very funny, though, was that uh, the only office space that they could find right, was next to an immigrant, <laughs> an, an immigrant's business. And I, did, I tried to go there every day. They were never open. I don't know if it was because they knew I was coming and I wanted to ask them questions, but... Somehow this, this was very uh, striking to me that, uh, that uh, they had a hard time finding uh, an open space. And this is actually uh, a little bit away from the city center. So actually, when I asked locals about it, they said, we didn't even know that there was an office. And I said, well, I found it. It's close to the train station. I was like, well, you know, that shows you how much we care about them. But they nonetheless were able to, they nonetheless were able to, um, uh, you know, get their preferred candidate into office. And uh, the current mayor has actually been, um, been very tough, uh, taken a very hard line against uh, not just immigrants in general, but specifically Chinese immigrants. And uh, last year was the very first time where um, after, um, after some very serious incidents, there was a murder um, a Chinese person murdered another Chinese person. Now they used that as, a, as an excuse to uh, actually bring in the army. And it's very funny in, in a way, sad in another, but there weren't, in, 
that they don't have enough actually uh, they don't actually have enough army uh, members or military members there in Prato because it's a smaller town they actually had to uh, they told me they said we had to borrow some from Bologna <laughs> about an hour away because they didn't have enough units stationed there and they said oh but it's very dangerous and uh, so the Chinese were like how how is this dangerous it happened yes we understand that but there was a, some kind of financial argument there was something about a loan and it's not it was the, one of the very first if not the first kind of uh, murder or kind of very serious kind of situation and so it's not very common to see this but um, they had helicopters in the air they had all of these uh, uh, troops come in and patrol um, which i uh, which shocked many of the chinese and of course they were uh, terrified uh, of what what this all meant uh, and um, you know most you know, it's not a surprise in, in times where, uh, where there's this kind of significant change and also um, uh, in times of economic hardship and crisis that a lot of stereotypes are running rampant. Uh, there are people who, there are many, uh, I, I, I spoke to uh, a large number of Italians as well and one said, you know, we, I think most Italians believe that the Chinese are just very quiet, they keep to themselves and that they're not well integrated not well integrated into Italian society because they have no need to be. Okay? They have their own language, friends, businesses, and community. And that's sort of the kind of prevailing sense. But the, the, the one thing that uh, I think we should keep in mind is that a lot of this has to do with structural features. It's not some kind of uh, you know, clash of civilizations that Samuel Huntington you know, sort of would argue for, that these cultural differences are things that can't be over, that you know are impossible to overcome. A lot of it has to do, as I mentioned, with it has to do with the work schedule. The Chinese are are usually sleeping when everybody else is working. At least the ones who work in the textile industry, right? They don't have as many opportunities to talk. They couldn't come out here and say, "All right, let's let's meet new people." Well, they're getting ready for work by now in the late afternoon, but during the day in the mornings, uh, they just don't have uh, they just don't have the opportunity. There are a lot of them who want to take classes. They, they try as uh, the best that they can. The problem is that the, the classes are usually held when they're working. They're usually at night when other people <laughs> have free time. But for them, they cannot take the classes very easily. Okay? And so these are, again, this doesn't mean that they don't want to engage or meet, new, meet Italians and be a part of Italian society. It just means that they, it's gonna, uh, there are some barriers to that. But these are not, at least in my view, these are not barriers that are you know, impossible to overcome. I think these are things that can be, that can be worked on. And they are actually trying very hard. They're actually really you know, trying very, uh, very hard to do this. And this is something that I pulled up, but this is a kind of a classic image, right? Bruce Lee fighting Chuck Norris, but in Rome, in Rome. But this is one of the first examples, but nobody ever talks about this. They're like, oh, you know, we want to get along. Um, but they, they always think about Marco Polo. I said, well, what about, you know, there's Bruce Lee coming to defend his, his uh, relatives who are being actually harassed by the Italian mafia, right? If, if those of you who've seen the movie, why are we, why, why can't we just get along? Why, why are we having all of these kinds of problems, right? And uh, it's a big question. They keep talking about it. It's like, uh, you know, can't we, can't we also find some kind of common ground, right? Whether it's culture or, or, or football, many of them, Many of the uh, Chinese uh, business owners, especially, who have a little bit more time, sometimes they'll go and get a coffee or, or, or maybe a drink at the local bar. That's how they learn Italian, that by watching football with everybody else, right? They're like, ah, AC Milan, and not, not, you know, not, not, not Barca, but they, they watch the Italian league, right? So they, ah, Milano. So that's how they learn their, their Italian. It's not perfect, but these are their moments, right, that, um, that are actually there are many more of these kinds of moments than we actually think. There are lots and lots of these opportunities, uh, and they're actually starting to, to take advantage of them. Okay? So I, I wanted just to raise, for discussion's sake, just a few possible scenarios, right? at least as uh, has been sort of laid out, or uh, as I can see in terms of, um, uh, in terms of the, uh, the research. One I already mentioned, clash of civilizations, is what the political, late political scientist Samuel Huntington uh, has argued that there are differences that are unbridgeable, right? People are just too different. 
There's just no way. And if anything, there will be a significant, significant conflict between people of different cultures and civilizations, as he calls them, right? But I think you know, one of the things with that, with that, that is problematic with this view is that it's very static. It just assumes that people will always stay the same, that they can't change. And they can't change. There's no possibility of change. Everything is very constant. And I think from, not only from my research, but the research of many others, it's very clear that that is an assumption and it's a false one. It doesn't really, that's not how things are working. Certainly not in the case of Prato, right? Things are changing, actually, uh, in many significant ways, even though we don't see them immediately, okay? Now, the other thing that people have talked about in Italy is immigration policy reform. You know, clearer requirements for citizenship, you know, you know kind of, um, uh, finally, a kind of comprehensive plan. But the problem, of course, is that given the kind of instability that we see in, in Italy right now, the likelihood of that happening, at least in the n near future, is not very high. Not very high. If anything, they've been trying very hard to slow down, uh, slow down uh, policy reform. Now, the one thing that uh, I've seen, though, is that over... Uh, over the last few years, and certainly uh, from the beginning of um, the Chinese immigration to Italy, is that you're seeing a lot more interdependence, right? And there's a lot, there's actually a lot of uh, social interaction. And it's not always that kind of confrontational Bruce Lee versus Chuck Norris kind of interaction. You actually have a lot, you, you see actually a lot of uh, Italians, for example, um, going to the park and wanting to learn uh, tai Chi, for example, right? There are a lot of people practicing. There are a lot of other events, and people actually go, and they try to actually learn. And then uh, you actually see a lot of students, young students, elementary school students, who are uh, going to museums with their classes or on field trips. And they're, they're, they're like, wow. They might be saying this in Mandarin, but they're like, wow, you know, Italian art is really amazing. And I was like, How do you, can you say that in Italian? Yeah, we can do that. <laughs> so they do both. When they're with their Chinese friends, sometimes they'll say it in, in, in Mandarin, but in, with their Italian friends, of course, they're like, ah, bellissima, right? So it's very funny that they can actually already make the kind of switch. Um, and it's not, I guess in some ways for us, maybe it's not so surprising, but for many people it is quite uh, surprising that um, after seeing this, and despite the problems that they've had, that I would have kind of a more optimistic view of what's going on. Okay, a much more optimistic view of what's going on. And I think, again, it's because of people who I've met who say, for example, I really, and this is a Chinese woman um, in her 30s, I want to have more Italian friends. I get along with my next door neighbors. They're, they're really nice. And even though some neighbors complain, uh, other neighbors actually try to calm them down and tell them that we're good people. And uh, they, really, they really try to help us. And they keep trying to explain to the other neighbors that they don't cause problems. They're actually good people. <laughs> so, you know, you have a lot of these smaller instances that, that are not well publicized, not well known, right? But these are happening in, uh, you know, among neighbors. They're happening in neighborhoods. And all of this collectively is starting to create, I think for the first time, some noticeable, some noticeable change, okay? Uh, so you have older Italians who are starting to understand the new immigrants. But you also have, as I said, young Chinese who are understanding Italy better, right? And it's very similar to what is going on here in Spain as well. You have younger Chinese who understand, and uh, uh, you know, I, and it's it's really amazing to me that I, I every I went to uh, on this trip. I've been to Valencia. I've been to of here, of course, here in Barcelona and Madrid. And every uh, Chinese uh, youngster I meet. I said, what, what is your favorite team? It's always the local team. I'm here in Barca, Barca, and then there's Real Madrid, and then the other one's Valencia. And I was like, why don't you like the other ones? No, no, this is, this is my home. This is my town, right? So they identify very quickly with, uh, with, with the area in which they live, right? It's very, um, uh, it's very typical. It's very typical. It's not unlike what you see with uh, Spanish or Italian children or American children. They tend to identify with their local team. And it's not, as for me, Los Lakers, Lakers, right? It's, and of course, here, the, the one thing that was very uh, uh, exciting for me, I went into the Adidas shop, I think, yesterday. And of course, they had a Pau Gasol jersey. I'm like, yeah, Lakers, right? But it, 
you know, a lot of this has to do again with uh, again the the kind of environment you're in and 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 you know the people that uh, uh, who you interact with, right? So um, that change is coming, right? And there's some there are a number of important similarities I think with the American experience and with any country that uh, receives a, a, a new immigrants, right? These kinds of processes certainly take quite a bit of time, but uh, we have to realize that uh, it's only been one generation and if anything, there's been a lot more change uh, in comparison to other societies who've also received uh, large numbers of immigrants. In the United States, it took well over 100 years for the Chinese to be uh, accepted, right? And here, it's happening uh, much, for, uh, much faster. So if we project forward a little bit, I certainly would say that the likelihood of the Chinese being integrated or, or being kind of more included or being a, a larger part of society is, uh, in, in Italy is going to be uh, much higher than we might otherwise think. So um, in that sense, uh, there is a kind of convergence with other societies, but it's also, uh, it's also something that uh, you know, certainly presents a challenge at this point, but I think as, they, as we would say in the United States, there's light at the end of the tunnel. There's something you know, positive, I think, that, that is going to come out of all of this, not only for the Chinese uh, in Italy, but for Italy as a whole. Okay, I'll, just, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. I, I, I would like you just use this uh, eh, microphone because mm -hmm. it's going to record you and, and then to record your voice. Okay, okay you can you, you can ask what you like. Okay, uh, I pass. Well, uh, first of all, thank you very much for today's second meeting. I mean, it it was a pleasure for all of us. To, um, <laughs> Um, well, I don't know the percentage of uh, Chinese immigrants returning after, uh, when they are old, mm -hmm. but isn't isn't the life abroad kind of disrupting the? Um, I mean, when you are old, you are supposed to be ca carried off by your son. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, th that's the so-called young or something like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, isn't it kind of in danger or something? That kind of relation between yeah, between families mm -hmm. mm. first i have i have to i really have to say i'm i'm really impressed and i can see that it's not only uh all of the talent that you have but also the incredible preparation that professor beltron has <laughs> uh has uh, has done in his class i mean because the the kind of uh really insightful very great questions that I've been getting all day long uh, is really just uh, uh, astounding. I think one of the things that you're seeing in Italy is that certainly for the older generation, they still have this idea. That at least they will be with maybe uh, you know, one, of the, one of their children. And usually it's an older, uh, the older child, uh, usually a son, but not always the case. So there's been some change. But um, in Italy, um, the one thing that was particularly striking uh, in my research is that many of them have said, well, you know, I came when I was much older, so I still think of myself as more Chinese and maybe not so well integrated in Italy. And I would like to go back to China one day. The one thing that has changed their calculus, because most of their children are, are in Italy, or a lot of, in many cases, they are. So I thought, well, maybe, how can they go back to China if their children are here and they want to be with their children? Well, the one thing that has changed all of this is uh, the social welfare uh, policies of, of, of the Chinese government. They're providing more of a pension. It's not a large one, um, but they provide some means for them to, uh, for the parents to actually live in China uh, somewhat independently, if they want, if they want. Um, but it's, 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 actually, uh, it's, it's actually a very important question because that, that kind of social dynamic, uh, I think, is something that hasn't, is, is not something that we understand very well. I've tried to ask that question to the people I've, uh, I've interviewed, and there are a lot of contradictions. 
because they all say, I want to go back one day. But the, the reality is that it's very hard for them to go back because once they've left uh, China for you know, a, a long time, when they do go back, and they, they, they actually do go back quite often, they find it hard to stay there for, for a long period of time. But they're like, oh, I miss, I miss espresso. I like an espresso, espresso doppio, I think. I would like that. That would be good. You know, so, uh, and it's very funny that, uh, you know, they, that they talk a lot about that. And they also say that they're just, um, outside of, of coffee, uh, a lot of the social aspects, they just, they're not used to it any longer. And so um, it, it is hard. But even here, because many of the children are taking over the businesses, they're so busy and they might be together, but uh, the kind of interactions that they have are very different now uh, from at least what they had expected what they expected. But um, it's very split, I would say. It's very split. There are some who still are able to uh, live that kind of, uh, uh, of, of life, um, but many others are, are limited because of these other, because of these other factors. Mm -hmm. so related to, to, what, uh, to his question? Yes. So what happened in other places with a longer tradition of Chinese immigration, such as the States, for example? Mm -hmm. What happened with this kind of Familiar relationships. Mm -hmm. Did they change? Yeah, they actually have changed uh, quite a lot. It's a, it's actually a big kind of topic uh, that is being studied among American academics because you actually see uh, the same kinds of patterns uh, kind of emerging in the Chinese community as in other, say, non-Chinese, more typically American or maybe say European American communities, where. Uh, and you're actually seeing this in China as well, where you're actually seeing a kind of a much uh, stronger focus on the immediate, the nuclear family. The extended relationships are starting to uh, not entirely fall apart, but they're not as strong as they once were. So uh, people live maybe, you know, maybe in the same city, but they don't come together quite as often. I asked, uh, for example, I, I asked this question to, pe to many of the uh, uh, folks in, in Italy and also here in Spain, and they said, you know, all our relatives are here. We don't really have any r reason to go back to China. But And I said, well, that's great. So you see them, you know, every weekend or, you know, said, no, no, we only get together for weddings or maybe, you know, a special occasion. I said, well, how often does that happen? Oh, once every few years. And I said, well, do you call? Do you talk? Well, sometimes. We're all busy, though. We each have our own shop. And I said, but, yeah, but all of you are in Madrid or all of you are in Barcelona. It's like, yeah. Sometimes we don't see each other that often, right? Other things start to uh, disrupt the kind of patterns that had existed before. It, it doesn't happen in all cases, but more and more, this is something that they're telling me. They keep saying that, you know, we just don't have the time uh, because our shops are open from you know, 10 o'clock to 8 o'clock or you know, whatever the hours are. By the time we get home and I take a shower and I eat, and, and then they all say, you know, in Spain we eat late here. You know, and it's like we eat at 10, and it's like by that time, I'm ready to go. After that, I'm, I'm ready to go to sleep. I, I don't have any time to go see my relatives. You know? So you know, they, they make jokes about it, but it, uh, uh, you know, they, given their schedule, it, is, it does seem actually much harder now than just even a few years ago. Um, they just, they're having a much harder time. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for your presentation. Mm -hmm. Thank and you. And now, uh, for my final project, I'm doing the Chinese student study in Catalonia. Uh huh. Great. Yeah. Uh, during the present uh, investigation, and I found that, uh, for example, the first generation in Spain that maybe sp speak well uh, Spanish, but mm -hmm. uh, maybe they can't write. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, for the second generation, they could speak well Catalan, mm -hmm. uh, Spanish, and uh, English, and uh, Chinese. Mm -hmm. So uh, my question is, um, what do you think that the second generation will uh, dedicate to the society? Mm -hmm. Yes, and uh, my second pro uh, question is, um, uh, for example, when I first came here, and uh, I brought some uh, accessories with me because at that time I I was planning to sell the accessories here, mm -hmm. uh, but it uh, it failed because uh, some of my friends suggest me that uh, could you 
exchange a label to like uh, oh. they made in Italy, you yeah. know? <laughs> sure. Yeah. Uh, I think it's a very mm, curious, interesting uh, topic mm -hmm. because why d why could I change it in made in Italy? It's very strange. Mm -hmm. But it, uh, maybe you could sell in the in a higher price and right. uh, yeah. Yeah. So. Mm, and uh, also, I found that some factories here in Spain that mm -hmm. they maybe they launch the the factory in Italy, mm -hmm. and maybe uh, they produce all the products in Italy and uh, uh, like they export to Spain, to France, mm -hmm. uh, to uh, other the European countries. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you think it uh, Italy will be a example like a welfare welfare a welfare? We're mm -hmm. fair uh, area for the whole European countries. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I think I'll, I'll start with the last question first. I think the uh, these networks are really uh, astounding. This is something that is also a fairly recent phenomenon. I mean, uh, you know, they, the 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 kinds of businesses that the Chinese are involved in in Italy and Spain are are different. They're in a wider variety of uh, businesses here, okay. and, and it has to do a lot with, uh, again, the, the kind of opportunities that exist in Spain versus in Italy. Okay, uh, and but it's also very, uh, even though they're very different, they're very complementary. Many of the businesses here, the wholesalers, they order from people in Italy, and then sometimes they'll order from China. So they they are attacking or they're targeting different kinds of markets, which is really incredible. They say, well, some of our customers want this kind of price, so they'll, they'll do that. And it's created a lot of ad additional opportunities. And even among uh, wholesalers who initially maybe said, oh, I won't, I'm only going to sell uh, you know, uh, clothing made in China because my customers want the lowest price, they realize, well, there are too many people who are selling clothes made in China. I'm going to now talk to my Chinese friends who are in France and in Italy, or they do the reverse. We started with higher priced goods, now we're gonna go for lower priced goods. So they just, they move very quickly, and it's provided a lot of additional uh, employment and uh, um, uh, opportunity for these, uh, for these Chinese businesses. The problem, of course, is that the profits are still very low, and it may not provide that kind of security uh, you know, for them. Uh, as much as they as much as they want, at least, um, and then in terms of the uh, your second question about the you know switching the labels, uh, a lot of it has to do with um, with people's impressions, right? They see made in Italy. There is that kind of romanticized views that oh, you know, it's all handmade. It's true, but supposedly by an artisan, right? You see black and white photos all the time. Oh, you know, handmade shoes in Italy, fantastic, but the the, the hands are different now. They're, they're, the hands are, are, are Chinese hands, right? They're just as good in many ways, maybe even better, right? Because the, the skill is there. But, um, but uh, it shocks people when they think, oh, you know, I didn't know that it, you know, my Ferragamos are made by Chinese people. I don't know. Now, what, what do I do? It's, it says made in Italy, and technically it's true. But what, I, I, didn't, I don't know what to do with that, right? I, have, I, have, I interviewed people, for example, who... They make purses, they make handbags uh, for Dolce & Gabbana, right? Very expensive. And it's true, they have a different standard. And one of them told me, I said, you know, when we sell to Dolce & Gabbana, it's for 100 euros uh, for each, each purse. Once Dolce & Gabbana gets it in their stores, they sell it for over 1,000 euros, all right? That's what you're paying for. They, they mark it up 10 times or more. Now, of course, their costs are very high because they have the expensive stores, they have all the advertising, but that gives you an idea, right? It's not just the label, there are additional costs, but, um, but they contract a lot of Chinese factories to, to do this work, but they also have very high standards. So, you know, a, a Dolce & Gabbana bag, handbag, that has the official label on is very different from one that looks very similar that you might get from a different business person or a different store that costs maybe you know, 25 or, or 50. The components are different. The zippers are not as good. The, the leather has been treated differently. And the design is just a little bit different, right? It's not the classic Dolce & Gabbana or the Gucci bag, you know, in the, in, the, in the advertising that you see. And then in terms of the second generation, first, second generation, those with the language 
uh, uh, abilities. And, and I would say also for, as, as uh, Professor Beltran and I were talking over lunch, also for a lot of Spanish students who are now uh, becoming very interested, like you, becoming interested in, in, in China or in Japan, those of you with the language skills are going to be actually the, the bridges between the two societies and the two cultures. It's a very important role, but it's also a, a role that I think sometimes people don't understand very well yet because it's still kind of in an early stage, right? A lot of it, of course, is economic interdependence, right? There are opportunities in China, there's opportunities in Spain, right? And uh, Prime Minister Zapatero also just went recently to China. So there's more and more cooperation. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of interest, right, in working together on renewable energy, all sorts of projects. I know for a fact uh, a lot of my friends who um, are interested in studying transportation systems in China, right, they're, of course, building their, their own high-speed rail system, but they're like, wow, you know, when I rode the Ave last time, that was magnificent, wow. We got to learn something from this. So there are a lot of opportunities. These are all anecdotal, but it gives you some idea, again, of the... Um, the kind of opportunity and the scale of opportunity. Right? There are lots and lots of opportunities, but um, we're going to need people who understand not just uh, the languages of both countries, but the, uh, uh, the, the culture, right? the social norms, how things work, right? with the different philosophies. And uh, when we study that more closely, you'll find that there are, much, there are many more commonalities uh, than, you, than you might think. Uh, and I think that's one of the real benefits, right, of having, uh, having people like you become interested and, 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 and have you eventually explain to others why, why there are these wonderful opportunities between groups that, at least on the surface, may seem to have you know, very little in common. There's actually a lot more than that. Okay? Great. Thanks. Yes. Hi. Uh, you mentioned at the beginning that among one of the factors that came together to mm -hmm. build this opportunity yeah. was this, demogra this demographic shift in Italy. Yes. By which um, all people retired and the children, they had yeah. been educated uh, yeah. and they wanted them to have a better life. Yes. They actually decided to have a better life. Yes. Do you think this um, history is going to repeat itself with different actors, in this case, in this case Chinese people? Do you think? Mm -hmm. How do you see the third generation of Chinese people um, facing all these hours, night shifts, yeah. and mm -hmm. et Yeah, great question. I think uh, um, it's very funny because many, many of the people I interviewed actually asked me the same question. They said, how do you, how do you see this? Because you come, in, you come from the United States, and my, my, my father actually runs a small factory. But they're like, but you do not want to take over the business. You're a professor. I said, well, my father gave me the opportunity to do something else. He said, follow whatever you like. You don't have to do what I do. And uh, there is a very kind of similar kind of feeling among many, not all, but many of the business people here. Okay? They, they, you know, a great number of them told me, they said, you know, I'm not running this shop so that I can then have my son or daughter then run it. Right? I don't want them to do I want them to do something else. Now, of course, there are some obstacles to this. Many of them do actually end up running the, you know, the cafe or the factory. And a lot of this has to do uh, with timing. It has to do with the fact that the children, when they came to Spain or when they came to Italy, they were already teenagers. They were 15, 16, 17 years old. As they're trying to learn the language, they're... Uh, their chances for uh, getting a university education, right, are, are much slimmer than most others, than, than for, say, somebody who came when they were six or seven. They pick up the language fast. They have more time also. Uh, and so for those who, especially of the first generation, who came when they were, you know, in, as, as teenagers, 15 or older, um, they typically end up running the shops and they repeat the cycle, but many have also now, now have young children. They're now, some of them are now, you know, in their late 20s, maybe early 30s, and some have young children. They said, you know, I'm going to leave it up to my child to decide. I don't necessarily want them to do this. These are, this is a very difficult kind of life 
right? And most of them say, you know, I, I'm, I'm doing this so that my child can have a chance. And some of them are very, uh, even more, they're, they're much stronger about this. They said, you know, if, if I run this business and when my child grows up and takes over this business, then I failed as a parent. I, I want them to do something different. I don't want them to do this. I don't want them to do this at all because this is not the kind of life that I want for them, right? I had no choice, but I want my children to have the chance to do something different if they want, if they want. If they take it over, that's fine too, but I would, I would like to see them do something different, okay? But um, it depends. I think it just, uh, some of it is timing and, and the kind of foundation, their educational kind of uh, foundation whether they have a strong one or not. And people have often, many of the people I interviewed have often commented, they said, you know, in the United States, it's different. You guys have education. I said, we didn't either. Many people didn't when they first started. Um, it's true that many of the immigrants from Taiwan and China, they, they did go for uh, graduate work. Um, a lot of them are college educated, yes. But that doesn't mean that all of them ended up as, as doctors or professors or lawyers. Um, but many did, and I think you'll see with a little bit more time a similar kind of phenomenon because many of the many of the children will be interested in that. And I've already heard of cases. They said, "Wow, we're really excited in our you know in our uh, town in Italy. We're going to have the very first uh, Chinese uh, a graduate of of Chinese background, right? Who's going to be a lawyer? He's the first, or she's the first, and we're going to have more. And you'll see." That this will this will happen, they just uh, there will be a, a kind of interest in this just among the among those children you know on their own. Yeah. Additional. Oh. Yeah. Yes. Um. About these Chinese-owned shops, the mm -hmm. textile ones. Yeah. Uh, did you see that the, um, the network? It's extending in the Chinese people, so they are selling mainly to the Chinese now, or they are maintaining the markets. Mm -hmm. They've actually their their networks are are becoming incredibly wide. Uh, it varies from shop to shop. Um, like the picture that I showed you, uh, many of the the factories uh, were selling directly to these kinds of uh, traders. But over the last, uh, I was there last year uh, in Italy in Prato as well. And here in Spain, you're seeing something very similar. They're selling more and more to non-Chinese uh, business. And they, they don't discriminate. They say, anybody who wants to buy our clothes, you're welcome to buy. Bring your euros. <laughs> I, I'm more than happy to sell uh, to you. And um, the networks are initially, I think it was because of language barriers. People, you know, through, they find this kind of information. They said, oh, it's easier for me to talk to someone who's Chinese, and I can, I can negotiate. But Many of the business people are very, very savvy. They, they look for business everywhere. Some of them have gotten to the point now where uh, here in Barcelona, for example, uh, they told me 70 to 80% of their customers are not Chinese. They are from uh, all over Spain, uh, Portugal, uh, and France, and sometimes even Italy. So it's reversed. It used to be uh, Spanish, uh, uh, business people or Chinese uh, Chinese business people in Spain buying from uh, businesses in Italy. Now Italians are uh, Italian businesses are buying from Chinese owned businesses here in Spain. So all of the networks are 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 changing direction. They're getting bigger. Uh, and they're looking for for business everywhere. But this initial phase, it, what it signifies to me is that this initial phase is starting to pass. It's really they're really entering a new phase where they're starting to. Uh, in, you know, become much more incorporated. People are starting to know. They don't care whether they're Chinese or not. They have, they have things that I want, and they have a good price. And that's the thing that is starting to matter more. Before, they weren't, they weren't so sure. They're just like, I don't understand what's going on there. I don't understand what they're talking about. Now, uh, it's really quite amazing, um, just in the last few years, how much um, the customer base has changed. Uh, and, then, and it's because these, um, a lot of it has to do with Chinese also having you know, more friends and more contacts uh, with people who are not uh, necessarily Chinese, right? They're Spanish, they're Italians, they're French, and the news spreads pretty quickly 
in these networks, and all sorts of people uh, come from all over, right, to buy to buy these uh, these products from uh, from these from these business people. Yeah. No, it's because um, the people used to speak about uh, Chinese networks. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, and at the start, maybe it's 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 necessary because yeah. they need credit. Right. But um, with do you think that with the time in in a decade or in 20 years, mm -hmm. they will dilute on the general network business? Uh, I think there will still be some there. I mean, if if you think comparatively, so for example, in the United States, uh, the I think that. I think the way the one way to think about it is sort of like concentric circles. That earlier core will still be there, but there will be more and more kind of packed on as well, and they will move back and forth very quickly. Um, the uh, overall, I would say, as time goes on, the the significance of these ties does uh, doesn't totally go away, but it does diminish a little bit because once they do become more prosperous. They can also. They don't necessarily have to only borrow money from their relatives. They they actually have established credit, and they can go to banks. They can go through kind of these more regularized, uh, you know, un uh, official kind of channels for capital, for uh, or even for any kind of uh, business partnerships. They don't have to rely only on this kind of uh, informal family-based network. But. Um, they they will always uh, appreciate it, and they always like to have it as a kind of a um, insurance of sorts, so that in case something doesn't go well, they can always go back to the family. But it, it may over time, it doesn't. Uh, for for many of them, they've already moved on, mostly because also the many of the family members have moved on to other places. So they they might for the uh, for the first ten years, they might be all in Barcelona. But then they say, well, you know, it's hard to do business in Barcelona. You know, I love Barca. I will always love Barca. I would cheer for Messi. But the problem is that it's hard. It's expensive to do business in in Barcelona. And I will maybe move to Bilbao, or I will move to Pamplona, or I will move to Granada, and they start to spread. There's a certain kind of uh, process where, at the initial stages, everybody saturates a market and then becomes so competitive that they eventually then start to separate. But the initial stage is very important, is because it's because that's where they get all their information, and it's because they don't have all of the language, and they can pool all their resources, and they can kind of work together. It's not because uh, uh, the Chinese feel that, oh, we're so different and we're so superior to everyone. It's because they just don't understand the, the environment. And once they do, then they said, oh, I don't, I don't want to, I don't need them anymore. I'm going to go and I'm going to, I'm going to be a, I'm going to make lots of euros, right, in another city. So there's a certain stage, and I, I think we're right on the edge of that, of moving into the next stage, right? It's not completely over yet because there are still people who are, who are coming who need those networks, but you're already seeing a lot of people move to other areas. Almost every single, uh, they, were all, they were all joking about this. They said, you know, before you could just, they were laughing. They said, you know, you only do research here in Barcelona, Valencia, and, and Madrid. It makes sense, but you know what? Chinese people are everywhere in Spain. Uh, you'll never finish your project. You have to go to Bilbao. You have to go here. You have to go. I'm like, before I could just finish the project. And they said, no. You know, Chinese are everywhere. So, and this is something that they didn't say three years ago. But they said, you know, with, especially with the economic crisis, it's changed many of the patterns uh, of, of business. They are really starting to get in that next stage of spreading out. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Kelvin, for a really... Um, accurate and and interesting picture of of migrant enterprise and Thank its you. strengths and yep. weaknesses and so on. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think I think it's worth pointing out um, that m migrant enterprise always takes this form. Yes, and not yep. just Chinese migrant no, enterprise, right. but yep. you know Italian and mm -hmm. and and Jewish and, yeah. and all the rest of it. Yes, because you know what migrants have as a resource that's the durable and more or less the only thing yes. is kinship mm -hmm. and, uh, right. and trust among yes. people from the same place. And I think it's uh, also worth pointing out that um, you know, there is a danger perhaps in talking too much about migrant enterprise as if it was characterized by families and networks because mm -hmm. this essentializes it. It makes mm -hmm. migrants seem different mm -hmm. and it makes it seem as though their cultures 
never change. Right. And what I'm, what I'm interested in in Prato, I mean, we now have in Prato a generation that's grown up there. Some of them are born there, right. speak Italian better mm -hmm. than Chinese and so mm -hmm. on. And whether in, um, among that group that continue to, um, to run these ethnic enterprises, whether there are signs there of the development of a new sort of entrepreneurial attitude mm -hmm. where uh, they make their business partnerships, not just their deals, not just their markets, but their partnerships with mm -hmm. Italians, whether they bring in a new professionalism, whether the old you know, family-based enterprise on the grandfather yep. or father, whether that sort of thing is, is uh, something of the past. That's one thing that I just would, li would mm -hmm. like to ask, I'm very interested in. Mm -hmm. and I, I, mean, I hope it's happening as well. Mm -hmm. and the second question that I wanted to ask, I hope you don't mind me no, not pushing at all. this one as well, because I thought you spoke a lot in a very uh, um, illuminating way about the role of the state mm -hmm. in, um, in promoting it Chinese immigration yes. into Southern Europe, mm -hmm. because of the, the role of the Italian state through its amnesties, mm -hmm. through its original yep. trade agreement with mm -hmm. China in 1980, mm -hmm. and also the role of the Chinese national state and of the provincial state mm -hmm. in Zhejiang and so on. Yeah. Uh, what I wanted to, I mean, what's beginning to worry me here in, in, in ethnic developments in the contemporary world is that the, the, the intrusive role of the state is mm -hmm. much greater than it's ever been in the past. I mean, in the past, the Chinese state didn't give a damn about its uh, um, citizens or residents right. overseas. It ignored them mm -hmm. and it even denounced them, in, yeah. you know, as you know, in the Qing yeah. dynasty. But now it sees them as a resource. Right. And it, I, I wonder whether, and, and also it sees them as a way of exporting capital, re-importing capital, yes. and so on. This is happening a lot mm -hmm. between Wenzhou and Italy now, yep. as you know. Yep. And I'm worried about this in the sense that you know, this introduces yet another angle of the sort of um, the fifth column idea, yep. the migrant mm -hmm. as representing some foreign interest, you know, all this stuff about the clash of civilizations. Right. I mean, it's important that we don't give um, s cre credence and right. substance to these ideas and it seems to me that some of the things that the Chinese state and mm -hmm. reactions of Berlusconi and the Italian state and so on right. you know they 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 they're making this this issue this racism and this mm -hmm. uh, uh, relegation of migrants to a sort of uh, an outsider alien status make it all much more difficult i wonder what your comment was on that yeah Italian no those experience. are great yeah thank you very much uh, gregor uh, yeah i i certainly agree with you on the first point about uh, you know, trying to definitely trying to avoid. Wow, we're getting. I, I just maybe maybe it was so ominous. I don't know what it, what exactly ex exactly happened here, but I had just caught, we were talking at lunch about how beautiful the weather was. But anyway, I agree with you. I agree with you about not essentializing the the sort of family enterprise dynamic. And I think that's the one thing that I saw that was very unusual. And and uh, and what I've tried to do. And I'll, I'm, I'd be very glad to share, you know, this uh, uh, the paper on which this talk is based. I didn't, I wasn't able to get into all the details, but uh, I see, I certainly see the situation as much more dynamic because uh, whether it's children taking over the business or forming other partnerships, there it, it it changes very quickly. Actually, as they see opportunities, I think much much faster than even we can document. We go out and we try to do these interviews and we try to figure out what's going on. But just in a, in a span of maybe one to three years, even, even the people who I've talked to have started to think very differently and they've even contradicted themselves. They said, no, we only used to work like this. And now they're, they're thinking much more expansively. And so they said, you know, it's not just about this. Maybe we can take advantage. Maybe we can take advantage of new opportunities by working with Italians, and you're actually seeing uh, uh, a number of partnerships where uh, some of the uh, some of the previous owners, the, the Italian owners who had decided to sell to the Chinese, a relative of theirs will actually be a consultant, for example, and actually do new designs, or they'll uh, advise them on uh, upgrading their equipment. They're doing all sorts of fascinating things now. Uh, in terms of that, and so it's the 
the rate of change is really, uh, in many ways, very hard for us to keep up with. So I, I absolutely agree. And I, I try to, uh, when writing about this, try to really uh, be aware and try to in incorporate as much as I can this kind of more dynamic aspect. Um, Wow, am I talking loud enough to overcome the, this is the, I'm competing with the rain here as it's really pouring now. I'm glad we're in, now maybe it's actually better that you're here at the talk than outside enjoying the sun because now it's this. But wow, this is really incredible. I didn't know that this was going to happen. Uh, now, on the, on the issue of the, uh, the role of the, of the state, uh, there certainly is, especially in Italy, there is this sense that the Chinese are a fifth column, that somehow, and part of this has been promoted by, or is a kind of an implication of this kind of, the characterization that Saviano gave, for example, that they're here doing all sorts of illegal things, uh, whether it's bringing in counterfeit goods from China or doing some other thing that, that, uh, that Italy frowns upon. Um, so there's this pervasive sense, even though there's basically no proof for that. Sure, they've done, they've brought in counterfeit goods. Yes, did they bribe people? Certainly. And that's happened. But uh, there isn't, uh, there, isn't, there isn't a kind of concerted effort. If anything, Chinese immigrants have complained that they have not received enough support from, Chi from the Chinese government when there's a, some kind of incident. So for example, here in Barcelona, I think it was two weeks ago, there was a Chinese business person who committed suicide, right? That was in the newspaper because he had been, uh, uh, inspectors had given him a lot of trouble, uh, didn't find his uh, establishment to be in accordance with regulations, right? And he committed suicide. And almost all of the Chinese who I've talked to here in, in Barcelona complained that the Chinese government did not stick up for this person and did not support the Chinese community here, especially after the Chinese government bought billions of euros in Spanish debt. Why aren't, why isn't the Chinese government doing more? That actually kind of, that kind of sentiment fuels this idea that there is a fifth column, that the, the Chinese diasporic community is some kind, somehow an extension of the state, even though they have very little uh, interaction with representatives of the Chinese government. They complain bitterly, actually, about how little uh, the Chinese government does on their behalf. So there, there are fractures, even though, even though the impression is that the Chinese, because they're, they have so many businesses, they seem to be everywhere, that, they, that this is some, somehow part of a conspiracy. It's actually something that has happened more organically because of these other processes and because of these other factors, rather than as some part of some kind of concerted plan, even though the, the Chinese government definitely wants to uh, take advantage of uh, these kinds of connections. They're working very hard now to, to find ways to say, hey, how can we get more of the overseas Chinese to be more connected to, to China? They have all sorts of programs now to bring the children back for study tours. Uh, they benefit from the remittances, as you mentioned. Um, but uh, it's not clear uh, to me uh, uh, at least when I've talked to people here and also in China, what the government is doing exactly to try to um, to really kind of um, take advantage uh, of, of the kind of potential that is there. Um, I think they, they might be just as confused in some ways or there, there might be significant disagreements about how to uh, sort of best take advantage of this situation. So it's a, it's a great point and I think that's also something that um, I certainly would like to uh, study more, more closely, but uh, it's been very difficult because uh, the Chinese consulate has not been very respons res responsive to my inquiries, uh, just for basic meetings, and others um, have a much, uh, kind of neg much more negative view, and so it's hard to sort of step back from that and see what is really going on. Um, but I'd like to. I think it's, an, it's a very important and very understudied uh, topic in all of this. Yeah. Thank you, thank you very much. I think that we have one state attack, yeah, know, yeah. one nature attack. Yeah. And thank you very much, but we have to finish. Okay. Now, eh? thank, thank you. you. Thank you.